You're listening to Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Good evening, everyone. Tonight is, well, it's Wednesday, the 29th. We're almost done March already. This has been a super fast month for me. How about you? <laughs> I um, I don't know. Every day I'm here, I'm I'm really grateful. I didn't think I was going to make it to my birthday this year. I I can't express some of the things that I'm feeling and seeing right now. I'm going to try. We're going to go all over the place tonight. So buckle up. <laughs> I've been seeing some stuff lately, just deep, dark, nasty stuff in real time where we're finding bodies of black t- children with their organs removed floating in rivers. This means we are much further along than I thought because we had talked about this several years ago, the harvesting and why are they black children of certain ages before puberty specifically, but young men too, under 16. Well, and this isn't racist, this is fact. The more melatonin you have in your organs, the better able you are to um, withstand radiation. So someone's concerned about that. No, when you see all around us violence, predation, psychosis, like all around us, it's difficult to think of anything spiritual or any kind of spiritual light as little more than a metaphor, a worn out fairy tale that people are just so weak they're grabbing onto anything. It's very easy to sink into all the lies and the filth, the claims and counterclaims being slung like boulders in this war between cruel giants and merciless demigods of this world. For those who think the veil isn't thinning or lifting, I'd ask you to take another considered look at everything happening in the world. It's not merely that the oligarchs and the predator-like elites and the sick, twisted, demented are past the point of caring anymore and have virtually dispensed with all disguises altogether. It's far more than that. What was once unseen is becoming seen at a gathering pace. I believe the spiritual light, however one wishes to conceptualize that, it's the insight in the wisdom born of Gnosis that can help us remain focused, balanced in the realm of the shifting sands. And speaking personally, The last few years have been hell. It's been hell for me. Not just difficult, but a series of cascadingly difficult events. But I still remain constant in communication anyway with my innermost that ember of divine fire that dwells in the heart of all sentience. The secret, this imperishable fire, has saved my life many occasions, every time. It's lifted me out of intellectual and emotional darkness. It inspires me to kindness and empathy, a sense of play, 
that is strange now in this world. Sure, I carry a lot of internal scars. Who doesn't? The war of imagination has been raging for many thousands of years. At least through my own eyes. And this light, this divine fire, can be viewed as a purely artistic concept to those of a rigidly materialistic mindset. That's fine. But to others, those who have walked in realms beyond this one, this is the principle of all creation. How things are meant to work beautifully magically in a web so complex and deep and intertwined that we have no idea if you've had a chance to look at my website or my Facebook page which I invite you to come take a look and join me please you've been seeing be posting some of the events that are happening on planet Earth right now that look like we are racing towards a better view with some popcorn for the end of days. In an actual biblical freaking sense of the word. And we know this. With all of these things going on, I know a lot of us have changed our lifestyle to keep going here. And we're all kind of fighting for our lives. What are we going to do? Are we ready? And I think we probably should all be working on ourselves in this vast, beautiful world where to make this body, these bodies we have inherited, took billions of years. And then these billions of years, what have we done? We can build stuff. We can build some awesome stuff. Fun stuff. Horrible stuff. Terrible stuff. Bloody stuff. Violent stuff. But what have we done for ourselves? Maybe if we stopped having and building, we'd be worrying about being. What are we going to do with our bodies? What could we do with our bodies? Because these bodies have been built on principles we know nothing about. The other thing that we're killing right now that just broke my heart when I, I saw this little BBC thing on TV a couple of days ago, talking about the turtles, and it was something I hadn't even thought of. Baby turtles. They're born alone, kind of buried in the sand. Mama buries them, leaves them. They wake up. And they're born on a full moon. They follow this full moon to the ocean. Now, because of our light pollution, they're following the full moon into the middle of traffic and dying by the hundreds of thousands. Of all the things that we could build, we haven't learned how important this interconnectedness is. That if you change one little thing, you rip out a whole line of that thread that touches millions of things that we know nothing about. Just like in our bodies. I've told you that I've been changing um, my diet lately and I've been working on which vitamins work, what helps, what doesn't help, and I've been very, very focused on that. Although yesterday, I have to tell you, it was really nice out. So there's men downstairs, not my men, other people's men, were downstairs barbecuing. And they were throwing down at that barbecue, and I almost lost my entire mind. I was about to trade myself for some chicken. <laughs> I was. Uh, yep, slutting around. So, boys, how much chicken we got there? So, yeah, that was my big laugh. I, I didn't end up going downstairs because I realized how silly that would be, just going down, going outside. So, what are you guys making? Because you know what they're making. They're making chicken. It's really good. 
I don't know if I'm going to give up meat forever, but um, until I'm better, I'm going to stay with this plan because it's actually worked. I realize everything works for me for six months, and then it crashes in a burning flame of hellishness. But I think this one is the kicker. I got up and started walking again. It's awkward. It's clumsy. But it's happening, so I'm going to keep going. Now, because of this world, because of what we've chosen to do, and I again say we, because there would be no guys destroying the rainforest so that we could pasture our animals if we did not want to eat those animals. There would be no guys building pipelines and destroying native homes and wetlands all over this planet if we did not want to drive our cars. Oil. <laughs> Oil is everything. We've chosen the mother's blood. And it's not going well for us. The amount of oil that it takes just for one tire. So it doesn't matter if this is special organic grass fed, massaged, yet tortured animals. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> it's still just as dangerous, still just as going to destroy this planet, and we have not given it enough thought at all. Because our minds have become narrow, small. Instead of thinking of the seven generations, which we couldn't really explain, instead of living together, we have chosen to fight in ways I have not seen this kind of racism. For most of my life, I haven't seen it. I know a lot of people did. Stuff that hasn't been around since, you know, my father was a kid and it's all coming back. There are many names for light, many unique perspectives and subtleties throughout cultures and the eyes of those who have witnessed it. For me, this light is the Omreya. It's an ancient name, one of my favorites. In the secret tongue spoken by musicians and magicians, seers long ago. Hope, joy, kindness, empathy, passion, adventure, friendship, love. All these things are of the true light. All these things are Omreya. There are those warriors and healers who occasionally, well, still work ceaselessly, I guess, to usher in this vital flame in both the seen and the unseen. And I pray now that such light may illuminate your path, fortify you for the times ahead. Because love is not lost, I hope. For me, I think that we must love or, or die in the trying of that. We don't know who we are because we haven't been told. And what's really scary is we don't trust ourselves. We need other people to tell us who we are. We don't. Really, guys? No one can tell you who you are. And those dreams that you used to have when you were a kid, and maybe some of you still have them, that tell you really what your past is, I think you can believe these things. It's nice to listen to everyone, of course, but when it really comes to what your history is, who your ancestors are from this planet and others, you got to know that. you got to trust yourself. And if you go looking and asking people, well, to start, that's good. It's always good. But for the real truth about you, and where you come from, you got to look inside. Peter 
the Van Damme has two new books out. One is a nonfiction work, Secret Machines, So Gods, attached to Tom um, Delange's Secret Machines project, Gods, attempt to put the ancient astronaut corpus of the past 50 years into an entirely new context. One explicitly connected to the mysterious cabal of these high-ranking government intelligence military figures Delange claims to be working with. To what end exactly? Is still a very open question at this point. I haven't finished Gods, so I can't comment on it completely yet. What I've read feels more like the secret doctrines or the secret teachings of all ages. More like that than the twelfth planet or the mission to Meconia. Which is to say it's far more of a primer on esoteric history with some UFO stuff sprinkled here and there for seasoning than a UFO book per se which you'd expect so it would probably make a worthwhile addition to your library as a reference text if nothing else I'm not exactly sure how it all plays out into the secret machines per se but I suppose we'll find out soon enough there are two more volumes planned in this so concurrently, Lavanda, and this is why I'm even bringing it up, released a fiction work called Lovecraft Code, The Lovecraft Code, a reference to the Da Vinci Code, I'm assuming, in which he posts a link, or at least posits a link, between Lovecraft's Cthulhu mythos and the ritual magic of Aleister Crowley amongst others. The rough concept here is there is a real world connection between the Cthulhu mythos, and I think there is, and the Book of Law et al. An argument buttressed by synchronistic dates and names, a connection inspired or driven by supernatural forces linking Crowley to Lovecraft come up a lot lately in my head anyway it's a novel pre premise for some well for um, a novel should be noted though that these parallels may not be entirely coincidental believe it or not there's a very common denominator between Lovecraft and Crowley and that's the always looming specter of British intelligence. Crowley, widely believed to have worked for the Crown during World War I, at the very least. Some claim he was recruited straight out of Cambridge. I think it's more like that. And for some time thereafter. How extensive his involvement with spycraft was exactly is a favorite part of the game for occultists. Some argue he was a spy all along. Others say he was typically overstating his involvement to bo bolster his cyclopedian ego. It's a toss-up, the way I see it. But meanwhile, let's go back to the States. Lovecraft was recruited by British intelligence agent Harry Houdini to co-write a story for Weird Ta Tales two full years before the call of the Cthulhu. They later collaborated on other projects as well. Now from Wiki, Imprisoned with the Pharaohs became a popular story and was received favorably by Houdini. The escape artist was so impressed that until his death, he continued offering the writer jobs, ghostwriting opportunities. Among them 
was an article criticizing astrology, for which he was paid $75, approximately 1040 in present-day terms, and a book entitled The Cancel, Cancer of Superstition, of which Lovecraft had completed an outline and some introductory pages prior to Houtini's death in 1926. So, to thank the author for his work, Houdini gave Lovecraft a signed copy of his 1924 book, A Magician Amongst the Spirits. Now, I doubt this led Lovecraft himself to work as a spy, though there's reason to believe that he may have worked as a courier, given his travels, but it's entirely possible that Houdini could have also hooked him up with some occult literature, um, the Book of Law, for instance, as research for the cancer of superstition. And if you're a booky kind of person, those two are must-haves occult-wise. You'll probably find them on, on YouTube. I think, I think the Book of Law is um, an audio book on YouTube. I think, you think. It's also certainly possible that one of the occultists Houdini could have introduced Lovecraft to was that um, fruitcake Alice Bailey, who I bring up a lot, founder of the Lucius Trust, widely seen as the godmother of modern age, new age movement. As a matter of fact, I think she is the writer of most of the mythos that people think is ancient knowledge right now that she wrote from her head because she's a crazy person. Anyway, a good argument could have been made that Bailey was providing weekend seekers with more acceptable variant on Crowleyism, a Crowley safe zone for suburban consumption kind of thing, safe place Crowley. <laughs> While both were well-born Britons who were drawn to the excitement of a cult renaissance, both claimed to be co-writers with supernatural beings, both were prolific writers and publishers of work many reasonable people find absolutely impenetrable, both jumbled a whole mess of traditions and teachings from the East and the West and put their own unique spin on them. And of course, both have been fertile targets for conspiracy theorizing, especially in the last 40 years or so. Big time talked about. Now, in one of the most well-read posts that I've read in a while, popular, I mean. It's been proposed that H.P. Lovecraft drew heavily on the works of Alice Bailey, theosophist, particularly her 1922 book, Initiation, Human and Solar, for his signature Cthulhu mystos. The other thing about Bailey and him, they were both rabid racist. A lot of their fear of the darkness were fear of black people. I didn't expect this to be overly controversial. Lovecraft actually refers to theosophy several times in the call of the Cthulhu and was known to have read this kind of literature, specifically that of William Scott Elliot. Let's take a break, guys. We're going to be right back. A couple minutes. Be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Oh, perfect. So, we are revisiting ancient things because the present can only be viewed from the past. And we are replaying some very terrible things. 2017, 
might seem to be like a hangover after a particularly nasty meth, glue, thunderbird bender, but it's actually a year of major anniversaries. Kenneth Arnold and Roswell, as well as the National Security Act, 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is interesting, with the Cthulhu misses, Mythos and Spy vs. Spy, and again Crowley, the Summer of Love, the Centennial of the Russian Revolution, so I don't know what's going on out there, um, but there's a lot more, all kinds of versaries to observe. It's interesting what comes up because there's a lot of multiple so fives and tens going on. We'll get to that. Now December will be the fifth anniversary of the 2012 apocalypse, ascension, absurdity, depending on your point of view. Last year that I felt really good. Still had the MS, but it was another one of those times that I pulled myself out of it and kind of fell back into it at the end of 2012. A lot of people said that they went through certain kinds of hell from 2012 on or there, something in their life kind of took a downturn after that. I can't help but wonder about the 2012 meme. It's come to my mind again. And I've been thinking about it for the last couple of years, and it certainly seems like something changed that year, that the bottom fell out of somewhere, but no one seemed to notice it at the time. I mean, Donald Trump is sitting in the White House, isn't he? Even if you're a Trump supporter, you have to admit this would have seemed ludicrous, impossible five years ago. But then again, people were laughing at the Nazis, thinking that they were buffoons, ridiculous, until they came into power. Now maybe the apocalypse works on different, on a different timeline than it does in movies. Maybe we're living in one, only we can't see the forest fire for the burning trees. History can only be written from a distance. And it's, it was 2007 that I started blogging on my site. So happy 10 year anniversary to me. <laughs> It's also a year that a newly elected senator with a weird, oblique connection to the Council of Nine announced his candidacy for president. I know we haven't talked about that one in a while. We'll go back to it. Well, Obama, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. He has, we'll, we'll do a whole show on that one because it's, it's pretty darn interesting. But this week marks, well, last week, marks the 20th anniversary of Heaven's Gate Suicides, an event that I've gone into quite some detail on. Whenever the media might have you believe the gate were a bona fide modern Gnostic set, set serious, rigorous about their work, deeply troubled by the emergence of the techno-surveillance state they saw emerging at the time. This also marks the 20th anniversary of the last of the Order of Solar Temple suicides, remember that, rendered in quotes, since many investigators subject suspect power play outside by outside parties with the OST mass deaths. Now I had wrote, written before in pretty big detail about the OST and their influence on pop culture here, 
the X-Files writers seemed especially fascinated with the OST and their unique status and history and the lingering questions over their death. Now, post-mortem reports claimed that the OST committed ritual suicide in order to spiritually ascend to Sirius, where they believed their souls orientated from, originated, came from. If this is true, this is another troubling link to the walk-ins from Sirius theme that Ruth Montgomery's um, seminal Aliens Among Us went into great detail, which also has been linked to Heaven's Gate suicide. Now, two weeks ago marks the 20th anniversary of the Phoenix Lights. Remember that? A controversial UFO sighting that caused a major media freaking meltdown and has been the focus of growing mythology ever since. What is particularly interesting about the Phoenix episode, however, however you look at it, is that it took place right down the highway from Heaven's Gate compound in the Rancho Santa Fe, California. It may have seen been seen as a final sign that the ride was here seeing how this web savvy cult was monitoring all kinds of info streams for omens portents. So this week also marks the 20th anniversary of the Outer Limits episode Double Helix which plays out like an idealized fantasy world version of Marshall Applewhite's most cherished beliefs. Seeing how the suicides were discovered before its airing, it plays a bizarre epitaph for the, the cult, its leader, their beliefs. How the hell that happened is anyone's guess. Now, speaking of double helixes, 1997 saw the announcement that the first major cloning had been done of Dolly, the sheep. The news was broken in Rosland, Scotland, of all places. Dan Brown fans, take note. More ominously, it was also the year IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary um, Kasparov in, in chess. Coincidentally, or not, Steve Jobs returned to Apple for a few months later and changed the world as we know it. One of his last projects was designing the Apple HQ, which looks like a freaking flying saucer, by the way. So why do all of those events feel so closely intertwined? Shall we say we've been warned? 1987 is the 30th anniversary of the publication of Whitley um, Stryber's seminal autobiography, Communion. Remember that one? Which brought the concept of alien deductions out of the fringes into the bookstore in America and other parts of the world, of course. It's hard to explain to younger people what a phenomenon that book was. The controversy it engendered the effect it had on culture across the board. Schreiber was well-known author of best-selling horror novels, a couple of which had been adapted into movies like Wolven and The Hunger. So, you know, we're seeing the Bowie link again. But never enjoyed a success like Communion which stayed on the New York bestsellers list for months, sold millions worldwide. Daytime talk shows were suddenly flora for abductees, either real or imagined, as were popular TV shows like Unsolved Mysteries. 
the craze made celebrities of the striper. Abduction researchers like Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs, and later Harvard psychologist John Mack. Online UFO researchers stewed on the high, on the sidelines, having traditionally regarded abduction reports with suspicion, if not contempt, because up until then, no one was talking about that part of it. Communion however, would lead to other projects, the Travis Walton bioptic fire in the sky, the X-Files, which became even a greater phenomenon than Stryber's book, and the Steven Spielberg maxi series, Taken, which would be Sci-Fi Channel's most watched series at the time of its airing. Now, 1987 was also the year the New Age seeped into the mainstream, and it's been insidiously rewriting its host body like a computer virus ever since. Pop culture was a medium, yet again, a miniseries based on Shirley MacLaine's spiritual autobiography. Out on a Limb, was aired on ABC, planted the seeds for the me generation's catch-as-catch-can theosophy 2.0, which made me think of Bailey, so that's why I'm bringing it all again, and then Cthulhu and the thing, and the, you see how my mind works? It makes me crazy, it really does. It makes me even crazier with a sober Tracy. <laughs> Oh my God. So 1987 saw Ramtha go wide with the publication of Jay-Z Knight's autobiography, A State of Mind. Channeling soon became a multi-million dollar industry, which hundreds of mini Ramthas popping out of the woodwork, dispensing greeting card harmonies for spiritual indiscriminate policy. All you need to do is squint, LOL your head around meaningfully, adopt a weird quasi-British accent, which I you know I argue about that. I think it sounds more Australian to me, but everyone has that same one for their official channeling voice, and then learn to spout pseudo-profoundities as if you were clever. Again, New Age craze is hard to explain today, though in a large part because the New Age is so ubiquitous today. It's woven into the cultural fabric of most Western and non-Western cultures. Yoga studios can be found in every sizable town, anywhere. Acupuncture, other alternative modalities are often covered by health insurance programs. Health stores are slowly displacing conventional supermarkets and many more traditional houses of spiritual Houses of worship, anyway, offer New Age programs like meditation, yoga, and self-acquisition to their congruence. So this came in. It's still the guys. It's still the company. It's still the government. But, you know, it's got a different look to it. 1987 was the Harmonic Convergence, a.k.a. New Age Woodstock meant to act as the movement's big hop over the cultural fence. But its organizers, which included the original 2012 guru, Jose um, Arguelles, I think, deeply misjudged the true nature of the movement and how it actually existed in the, I don't know, how would we say it? The new biosphere, completely separate. This wasn't a revolution. It was a slow-moving insurrection, 
one that subverted culture from within, all the while denying its very existence. The hallmark of a true New Ager is they actually deny being a New Ager. As soon as someone says, I'm not a New Ager, be suspicious. Be very, very suspicious. So big, showy events weren't going to do the work. Tenacious, relentless, but quieter action were going to insinuate the New Age into the mainstream. Nineteen eighty seven saw the Iran Contra affair in which the arms were sold to Iran in exchange for American hostages held by the Iran controlled radicals and the profits were diverted into anti Sinistas militias in Nicaragua became the major news story, dominating headlines and Sunday talks shows for an entire year and pretty much into the next two. Iran-Contra is arguably the impetus for the true mainstreaming of conspiracy theories, just in time for the drawing of the Internet era, like it was a plan. Right? Conspiracy research wasn't a fringe hobby then. It was front page news all across the world. It's just that the virus escaped from the lab and filter down into places mainstream media would have rather it hadn't. But the real groundwork for the rise of the conspiracy culture would be laid ten years earlier, when the first fully functional home computer, the Commodore, P.E.T., was debuted as a trade show. Conspiracy theory may have thrived on talk radio and shortwave and ham radio, not to mention mail order, but it would explode on the Internet. Even in the crudest venues of the BBS dial-in days, when it was slow, when you know that sound, and that... You know that sound, even when that started. Now, at the same time, Commodore was unveiled, a new president from the Plains, Georgia, took office, who swore to tear the lid off government corruption and specifically UFO secrecy in Washington. Things predictably didn't work out so well for him. 1977 saw the commotion of the modern Hollywood blockbuster already having birthed itself in 1975 with Spielberg's Jaws. George Lucas, spiritual sci-fi epic, Star Wars, and Spielberg's UFO Fantasia, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, changed the rules forever. You can throw in Saturday Night Fever if you like, as it spawned the rise of blockbuster soundtracks as well, and as many would argue, planted the seeds for the eventual creation um, impoverishment of Hollywood that they created. In today's market, doubles and triples are no longer enough. You need to either write a movie off of a tax loss or score a Grand Slam blockbuster complete with marketing and merchandising and the rights and all these things, but Star Wars and Close Encounters were such monsters because they filled a genuine void in the culture, a need for miracle and transcendence in a rapidly sexualized culture. In their wake, the movies would become the dream of the theater masses in the same way that the great cathedrals were the peasants of the Middle Age. And this is why I said before this was the marriage. This is how it happens. Let's take a little break, stretch your legs, and we will be right back. Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Trace Elements today with 
Tracy Kennedy. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. And we've done so well today. Everything's worked out. Um, Revolution Radio is working great. And I'm actually even making it back in time after uh, the break. So cooking with fire here. So let's continue. The films, both films, stuck, struck the right place. You know, NASA tested its first space shuttle at the beginning of the year, promising a new era of space exploration, one that has yet to come, 40 years later, I admit. Even so, the moon was right at the time. The other end of the ritual spectrum, 1977, also saw the arrest of David Berkowitz, whom the media named as the sole son of Sam killer, despite the fact that witnesses had cogently and explicitly described other shooters not matching his description, Berkowitz himself would later claim that he was a member of a sect of the Process Church that we've talked about before, the Process Church of the Final Judgment. He was not only, he was not the only shooter, and that the killings were actually human sacrifices. And as fate would have it, two of the men he claimed as accomplices would die under mysterious circumstances not long after Berkowitz was arrested. And their father was named Sam. Also, summer of 1977, Elvis Presley died after a long struggle with obesity and prescription drug abuse. It's poetic in a Greek tragedy sort of fashion. Since 77, not only saw the rise of disco as an all-consuming craze, Donna Summer had the first hit with the totally synchronized or synthesized record, I Feel Love, that year, but also the breakthrough of punk rock and the first wave of new wave. So the Sex Pistols, The Clash, Elvis Costello, Talking Heads, all released their debuts, which took the basic four to the floor, rock and roll kind of stuff, Presley cut his teeth on, and wed it to the postmodern data and other weird continental theories that old timers like the king would never have anything to do with. Not that most America even noticed. The Eagles, Hotel California, Pink Floyd's Animals, Fleetwood Max rumors were albums most of the public were actually buying. Punk bombed bad. It's your first salt on, on America. Record sales and the most of the first wave bands would soon break up, radically water down their styles in a bid to make it more U.S. Top 40 E. <laughs> New Wave, which began as a marketing ploy to ease punk into American market, so it was all planned, would become a musical equivalent of New Age, a contagion that would insinuate itself into the host, rewrite the matrix from within, which is happening on all levels. Forty years later, New Wave concepts were so dominant, irony, sarcasm, not the least amongst them, in pop, they're no longer recognized as distinct or unique, but the process began in earnest 35 years ago when MTV began beaming art school weirdos from England into a growing number of American and Canadian living rooms. In short order, even Jethro Tall and Bob Dylan, one time crunchiest of the crunchy, were recording with drum machines and sequencers. So, 20th anniversary of Buffy, 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, 
just as Teresa, Teresa May burns it to the ground. <laughs> so a lot of things happened in that year. Now, as for the spy versus spy stuff, we are stuck in the fun house that was brought by these things. Now, fun houses are only fun when you leave them. When the distorting mirror images become your new day-to-day -day reality construct, it's not so much fun anymore. I dreaded the 2016 election because I had a very strong feeling that no matter who won, we'd be plunged into a dystopian paradigm in which major power blokes would erupt into all-out warfare. And I sensed that neither Trump nor Clinton possessed anything close to the political skills or the communicative powers to keep the carnage fully out of our view or our path. And I was right. Trump's only been in office for a little over, what, a couple months now? And I'm exhausted already. I'm certainly not alone in this. It all feels like a TV sitcom in its seventh season, well after the writers ran out of story ideas. The shark has been good and jumped. And the ratings, the approval ratings in this case, are plunging too. What is truly demoralizing though is the utter transparency of the secret war playing out, the seemingly endless spy versus spy thrust, counter thrust, the obvious deceptions. Even more so is the animal farm-like metamorphosis of the Democratic Party into the full-blown funhouse mirror of McCarty-era Republicans with Glenn Beck-worthy conspiracy theories thrown in for good measure. Now, I don't know about you, but all of a sudden the world seems especially cold and hard and gray and harsh. Masks are coming off, velvet gloves tossed into the waste bin. It doesn't seem to matter who wins the scorpion fight. You're still stuck with the scorpion at the end. We can't play, or we can't call out the play-by-play -play because it's largely being acted out behind closed doors. But we can look at the collateral damage and make certain speculations. There's no doubt that it would be just as bad, probably worse, if Hitler won. Even so, this feels especially grating. And you've probably seen this story. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones on Friday apologized to the owner of a Washington pizzeria that became the subject of a conspiracy theory about human trafficking last year. Pizza shop, Comet Ping Pong, was thrust into the spotlight last year after gunmen allegedly fired a shot inside the restaurant. The suspect said that he was investigating the unsubstantiated conspiracy theory that Hillary Clinton and her campaign chairman, John Podesta, Podesta is his name, were operating a child trafficking ring out of the restaurant. So the theory, which became known as Pizzagate, had circulated amongst far-right conspiracy theory websites and social media accounts in our commentary about what had become known as Pizzagate, I made comments about Mr. Alphantis that in hindsight I regret, for which I apologize to him, says Jones, who runs InfoWars, said in the video that James Alphantis is the owner of Comet Ping Pong. Jones said his website relied on reporters who are no longer employed by InfoWars 
and that the video reports about Pizzagate were removed from the website. He also invited Alphantis onto the show to discuss the incident. It was preceded by this story. FBI's Russia probe expands to include Pizzagate threats. So according to McCartney, um, McClatchkey, McClat, Mick, Clatch, gee, I think, news. The FBI's Russian influence probe agents were exploring whether far-right news operations, including pro-Donald Trump sites like the Breitbart News and Infowars, took any actions to assist Russian operatives. Trump's ousted National Secretary Michael Flynn and his son a member of Trump's transition team, or amongst those who boosted the so-called Pizzagate pedophile conspiracy theory. I doubt this will quell the fever amongst the Pizzagaters. On site like 4chan and Vote, V-O-A-T, given the suspicion that many on the fringes regard Alex Jones <laughs> with it may in fact give the flagging movement a fresh jolt. Jones's apology may also have to do with the drive to purge YouTube of extremist content and the controversy after using advertisement on videos corporate clients find objectionable. A world without sin as it might be put. So much for theories about the FBI. <laughs> that the FBI was ready to make arrests of prominent Washington figures related to Pizzagate. Has any mass arrest internet story ever panned out? Even once? Come on, guys. Maybe it has. I don't know. Donald Trump became president on January 20th. In one short month, there were more than 1,500 arrests for sex crimes, racing from trafficking to pedophilia. Big deal? You bet. In all of 2014, there were fewer than 400 sex trafficking-related arrests, according to the FBI crime statistics. Liz Croton at townhealth.com has put together a great piece on the push by Trump administration to crack down on sex crimes. And she notes that while this should be one of the biggest stories in national news, the mainstream media has barely, if at all, covered any of the mass pedophile arrests. This begs the question, why? This has nothing to do with Trump. In fact, never did. Since these kinds of actions are planned months in advance, the arrests continue, in case you were wondering, with major busts going on a near weekly basis. Someone's cleaning house. That is all. For what it's worth, I've always reckoned that Pizzagate was in fact a cover, a distraction for something far more hidden, hidden, a struggle that we know nothing about, one that will take place way under the radar. Now, as I was looking back in November and didn't have time to talk to you about that, no one is saying as much, but this is very much feels connected to a deeper, more covert war. Why would I say such a thing? Because at the same time that Pizzagate went dark, we've seen major strikes taken against international pedophilia which actually is a global conspiracy with its own networks and secret codes and moles within established centers of power, such as schools and police departments and governance. But we knew this. I know it gives us a chance to all feel that something good is happening and that we have stopped a horrible thing because we all think we're a little bit inv invested in this stuff. But... I look at the truth. I look at 
well, I got kicked off a native site today because I made a comment and was told to shut the hell up. But did I? No, I did not. Because there are little girls and little boys all across Canada on the natives' reserves killing themselves. And they're saying this this is because of the colonists and their takeover. Well, the colonists are not on the reserve. Kids are killing themselves rather than to be with you. So that means the failure is with the families. Sorry, not popular. You know, I, I'm not a nice guy, <laughs> I guess. So I was kicked off the site anyway. So I'm just complaining about it, but I'm, I'm right. If they're not taking care of their kids, how would they expect other people to care? We don't care about our kids. Our kids are being hurt because we don't care enough. These things would not happen if we stopped them from happening. Things being done to us is because we're allowing it to be done. Anyway. Why would I say such a thing? Because at the same time, the pizza gate went dark. All these things went on with such combustible accusations and such potential for a scandal that could quickly spread out of control, like involve political figures you're not trying to destroy. You'd naturally expect the action to go dark and the fall guys to be placed pretty far down while well, pretty low in the food chain. Now remember, prior a prior investigation begged one of the most powerful people in Washington at one time, former Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert. Ever wonder what it'd be like to die in a plane crash? <laughs> It may be sheer coincidence, but James Alphantis, former partner, suffered a major heart attack this week. Media Matters for American founder David Brock was rushed to the hospital on Tuesday after suffering a heart attack. Now, according to a press release from MMA, the founder of the Lipo Media Watchdog and analysis website was rushed to the hospital early Tuesday afternoon and received treatment. Sure, it may be a coincidence or it may be what I like to call falling down an elevator shaft onto some bullets. But I couldn't help but remember this other story published soon after the election. Dems to David Brock. Stop helping. You're killing us. Democrats know they need someone to lead them out of the wilderness. But they say that someone is not David Brock. As David Brock attempts to position himself as leader in the rebuilding demoralized Democratic Party, in the age of Trump, many leading Democratic organizers and operatives are wishing that the man would simply shut up, disappear. Disappeared is the word they used. Many in the party, Clinton loyalists, Obama veterans, and Bernie supporters alike, talk about the man not as a sought-after ally, but in the fight against Trumpism, but as a nuisance, a hanger-on, an overseer with a colossal waste of cash. And former employees say that he has hurt the cause. And it's worth remembering that Breitbart.com, Andrew Breitbart, died of a heart attack at age 43. A year before, he posted a cryptic tweet that someone have since linked to Pizzagate stuff. Just before his death, he hyped some revelation about Barack Obama's past. A coroner in the office handing, while well, handling 
Breitbart's body subsequently died of arsenic po poisoning. The day that Breitbart's um, autopsy results were revealed, in fact, we also saw James Comey revive Russiagate, which had been flatlining after Fault 7. Any illustrations among Trump fans that the FBI was secretly on their side were ground into powder, basically. Between this revelation and the Pizzagate conspiracy investigations, no one well, one could help but wonder if the new Praetorians, I've noticed that the Praetorian meme has been picked up by more prominent commenters, but you heard it from me first, are losing the last shred of their patience with Donald Trump's shenanigans and are playing imminent regime change, which does not surprise me. So from Washington AP, the FBI are investigating whether Donald Trump's associates coordinated with Russian officials in an effort to sway the 2016 electoral process, Director James Comey said Monday. In an extraordinarily public confirmation of a probe, the president has refused to acknowledge, dismissed as fake news, blamed on the Democrats. In a bruising five-hour session, the FBI director also knocked down Trump's claim that his predecessor had wiretapped his New York skyscraper, an assertion that has distracted White House officials, frustrated fellow Republicans, who acknowledge they've seen no evidence to support it, even a little bit. So, how surreal is the world in which you live in. So much so that the mainstream political site, The Hill, is comparing the action in Washington to a Stanley Kubrick film, one that has become notorious for conspiracy theories that have been projected onto it, as well as familiar to people who listen to me. So on the 40th anniversary of the publication of The Shining, Stephen King must be wondering if Washington is working on its own sequel. For the last couple months, Washington has been on the edge, like we are all trapped in Overlook Hotel, with every day bringing a new jump scare, often preceded by a telltale tweet. Indeed, a Twitter whistle has been replaced with um, suspenseful music to put the entire city on the edge of their seats. In the Shining sequel, however, people are sharply divided on who is the deranged ex- axe-wheeling villain in this lodge, the president or the press, ironically, with the recent disclosure that some of the Trump campaign may indeed have been subject to surveillance, the president is looking more like Danny Torrance, a character dismissed for constantly muttering red rum, red rum, until someone finally looked in the mirror at the reverse image to see what it said. Yeah, I'm not really feeling the metaphor here either, but whatever. It's been that kind of year. Now the internet is burning up with theories that disgraced National Secretary Advisor Michael Flynn has turned and is going to testify against the Trump administration or at least figures attached to it. It's hard to imagine that a three-star general can be stupid enough to be guilty of things Flynn's been accused of. But that may speak to the culture of impunity in Washington, which your misdeeds are only punished if you get on the wrong side of the wrong people. Take our last break, guys. We'll be right back. Welcome back, 
Kathy Wynn. And as to answer um, how much chicken, <laughs> I guess the question was if I was going to forfeit my honor, um, how much chicken would it take? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Just move along. Anyway, what's going on right now is like a really bad cyberpunk novel. And one wonders if the secret war has spread outside Washington because that car service provider, the giant Uber, is having major run of rotten luck lately. Now, it is suspending its self-driving car program after one of its anonymous, autonomous vehicles was involved in a high-impact crash in Arizona, the latest incident for a company reeling from multiple crises. Crises? <laughs> I think crises. Anyway, in a photo posted on Twitter, one of Uber's Volvo, which, you know, Volvo's, it should never have been a Volvo. Volvo's are just awful. Anyway, self-driving SUVs is pictured on its side next to another car with dents and smashed windows. An Uber spokesperson confirmed the incident, the veracity of the photo, and added that the ride hailing company is suspending its autonomous tests in Arizona until it completes its investigation and pausing its Pittsburgh operations. Now, the incident also comes as Uber and Chief Executive Officer Travis Kalanick is currently under scrutiny because of a series of scandals. Riot Hailing Company has been accused of operating a sexist workplace. This month, New York Times reported that Uber used a tool called Grayball to help drivers evade government regulators and enforce officials. Kalanick said that he needed leadership help after Bloomberg published a video showing him arguing with an Uber driver. So who did Kalanick piss off? Because coincidentally, and here's that word again, the crash comes soon after WikiLeaks revealed CIA hackers had the ability to override computer systems in automobiles. Now, this is from Mashable. WikiLeaks had published a trove of files saying that it says that are linked to the CIA's hacking operations, which apparently includes efforts to hack into cars. The first in the series was called Vault 7. Year Zero supposedly comprises 8,000. 761 documents and files from an isolated high security network situated inside CIA Center for Cyber Intelligence Langley, Virginia. Year Zero details the CIA's malware arsenal and Zero Day exploits against Apple iPhones, Google's Android operating systems, Microsoft Windows, and Samsung's TVs. Now, according to a document in 2014, the CIA was also looking at infecting the vehicle control systems used by all modern cars and trucks. So that's reassuring. Speaking of control systems, apparently pimps are controlling prostitutes with RFID chips now. It turns out that this 20-something woman was being pimped out by a boyfriend, forced to sell herself for sex, and hand him the money. It was a small glass tube capsule with a little, almost like a circuit board inside it, he said, it's an RFID chip. It's used to tag cats and dogs. And someone tagged her like an animal, like someone's pet that they owned. This is human trafficking. There's almost nothing done about human trafficking, so don't get excited by the couple of arrests. 
it's a marginal issue here for the most part. Part of that is because the average person isn't sure what human trafficking, even modern slavery, what it actually means. Technology is our friend though, right? And now this. Turkish hackers threaten to wipe millions of iPhones, demand ransom from Apple. Now, today, courtesy of CIO, we learned that a group of hackers, referring to themselves as the Turkish crime family, has been in direct contact with Apple, and it's demanding $150,000 ransom by April 7th, the day before my birthday, where they will proceed to wipe as many as 600 million Apple devices for which they allegedly have passwords and will wipe them all out. The group said via email that it has a database of about 519 million iCloud credentials for some time, but did not attempt to sell it until now. The interest for such accounts on the black market has been low due to security measures Apple's have put in place in recent years. Now, since announcing its plan to wipe devices associated with iCloud accounts, the group claimed that other hackers have stepped forward and shared additional credit credentials, account credentials, with them. And currently, the current number anyway, holds at over 627 million. Million. Now, according to the hackers, over 220 million of these credentials have been verified to work and provide access to iCloud accounts and don't have security measures like the two-factor um, authentication turned on. Of course, if credible, with an ask of just 150K, this is the most modest group of hackers ever. Now, given the, the war that's erupted between the increasingly aggressive Turkish government and the EU, money may clearly not be the objective here. Turkish PM Erdogan is clearly set on re constructing the old Ottoman Empire and shivering Apple might just be part of the march. Besides, Turkey is taking a recent coup attempt, which is almost universally blamed on the CIA, very personally. Now, speaking of the EU, I've seen stories that Trump advisor Steve Bannon wants to dissolve the union, which may be why Trump adversary John McCain announced his unallowed support for it and the new world order, in his words, not mine. The world cries out for American and European leadership through the EU and NATO, U.S. Senator John McCain said on Friday, March 24th. The world cries out for leadership. In a new world order under enormous strain and in the titanic struggle with forces of radicalism, we can't stand by and lament. We've got to get involved, said McCain, a former Republican, presidential candidate, and now chairman of Armed Services Committee in the U.S. Senate. Now, speaking at the Brussels Forum, a committee organized by the German Marshall Fund, transatlantic think tank, he said that the EU and the U.S. needed to develop more cooperation, more connectivity. I trust the EU, he said, defending the opposite view of the U.S. President, Donald Trump, who said in January that the UK was so smart in getting out of the EU and that NATO 
was obsolete. He said that the EU was one of the most important alliances for the U.S., that the EU and NATO were the two or the best two sums in history, which have maintained peace for the last 70 years. We need to rely on NATO and have NATO that adjust the new challenges, he said. Now, would McCain speak this way to a domestic audience? Of course not. Or maybe he would. I can't tell which way is up anymore, really. But either way, it's good to know where he really stands. And like McCain, China continues to sound a similar note of support for globalization, which is very economic. Well, it's very economic survival, so desperately depends on this. Now, Chinese Vice Premier Zhang Gao told a gathering of Asian leaders that the world must commit to a multilateral free trade under the World Trade Organization and needs to reform the global economic governance. The river of globalization and free trade will always move forward with unstoppable momentum to the vast ocean of global economy. China will remain strong force in the world economy for peace, peace and stability, he said, adding that countries must respect one another's core interests and refrain from undermining regional stability. I suppose this is why China is off target list for our new cold um, wars. I've resisted saying this because it's just so depressing. I've been actually what written a few pieces on this and couldn't figure out what to say but I suppose I just wanted to, it to go on record all the skullduggery posterity's sake which is why I refrained from commenting at all or at least for the most part instead of adding that it became a new, strange, memetic virus in which the the way, the same way the Franklin Boys Town scandal did in the 90s. Note that prior to the election and Pizzagate Trump nemesis, the Washington Post was all over this sex trafficking stuff. The ongoing legal and police actions coinciding with the moves to shut down Pizzagate on the fringes of the web seem exactly like the kind of action one would expect if there was a serious operation at work. Shutting down the internet chatter makes perfect sense in this context anyway because, you know, you get compliance with these things. So, I thought from the beginning, guys, that um, Pizzagate was just about something to look at. It's going to look over here, or well, something very bad is going on over there. It's a cesspool, the bottom of the rabbit hole, starting to resolve into a clear view. I've seen things I'm not going to unsee in this lifetime. I also think, expect really, that this is ultimately going to tie into our good friends. It's a, a significant fraction of them anyway. Will turn out to have been demons by any other name. I think Trump has been working towards perhaps cleaning this up. I'm not sure. One thing is for sure, he's either with us or with the terrorists. I don't know. But I'm exhausted 
I feel like it's been a non-stop magical war that only intensified after the election and then again after the inauguration. I hope we're heading into some kind of denouement. I don't know how many more rackets of tension my sanity can take at this point. <laughs> but, you know, whatever the heck is going on is crazy stuff. And that's why it brought me back. Because, of course, things have been fragile for the last 40 years or so. And in one of the... One of my favorite posts was Bailey, an initiation. I don't suspect much to be over controversial here because we have to go back to the Lovecraft and Call of the Cthulhu and the similarities of what is going on in this timeline. Lovecraft, like all, well, many important artists, was unapologetic with his influences of the old one. Claiming Lovecraft was pillaging from Poe or Dunsany isn't remotely controversial, but I guess suggesting that the hallowed Cthulhu mythos might have been lifted <laughs> from something fragile, a hothouse of theosophy, is not too far out of my mindset. Never mind that theosophy and other esoteric systems are constantly being ransacked by everything that's going on right now. More than the various parallels is the gestalt. Lovecraft seemed impressed by Bailey's swing for the fences cosmology and may have figured it to be potential for strip mining for the mythos is surely, surely, slowly fermenting in order for various horror, horrors that he was thinking of. It's hard to read Bailey's swivel-eyed cosmologies and not see the lines of continuity and theft with Lovecraft. It's actually hard to read Bailey at all. In spite of their obvious differences, both were creatures of the late Victorian era, would-be aristocrats straining back towards a mythos of lost eras. Both sound of shrifted and archaic language. Both were fond of calling down impossibly ancient, powerful forces in their writing. Initiation human and solar. It's an interesting source for Lovecraft's pillaging. But there's another Bailey word salad that was released closer to the writing of Call of the Cthulhu. A treatise on the cosmic fire. It's just as impenetrable and florid as Bailey's others, other works, which people keep regurgitating as myth, as truth, and has nothing to do with anything any ancient person said, ever. But they constructed other forms. They caused, called for cosmic fire. They caused and called for all things to be brought back into life for a period of destruction that extended far with either of their hands. The work talked about the return of the ancient ones, the old ones, the sons of the cosmic evil, the rhesus of the darkest constellations gathered for their lesser horse, the darkest spawn of hell. They darkened all space. All this sounds very Lovecraftian, doesn't it? Dark forces from the stars rising up, demons who were unable to be controlled. Very florid, very purple, very large. Compare this with the Cthulhu. Void, as they are of lordship 
over ghouls and night gods, the mindless, the shapeless, the blasphemies of outer space, can yet control them when they must compare ghouls and night gods with animating shades and gazing into the silence of their work with the void as they of lordship. Two different ways of telling the same story, amazingly. Bailey outshines even Lovecraft when it comes to the dark purple. However, there's a mention of Dazen. In a letter to Lovecraft that he wrote, that was written to him, that he mentions the Cthulhu. Initially, I chalked this up to another writer withholding information to protect a source, perhaps, but the word decent apparently only is mentioned twice in a treatise on cosmic fire. And given the fact that Bailey hammers even more the most attentive reader over the head with a blizzard of garbled terms and made-up names, Lovecraft can be easily forgiven for overlooking it. Mighty Ones returning to time. Mighty Ones coming back. The ancient evils returning. So remember, Bailey predates Lovecraft. And that treatise on cosmic fire would be relatively fresh when Lovecraft was working on Cthulhu. But their words brought back something very old. And unfortunately, very, very evil. <laughs> to us there's been so much for one year hasn't there these are Gnostic times challenging to deal with everything old is new again it's an open question which direction this will take as a new establishment defunds all the old religions. But we see both the rise of secularism and the rise of spiritual but not religious, which is the thing to say now. Given the fact that atheists have close to zero birth rates and that the evangelical millennials would well return into the fold for some when they hit middle age things look very different in 20 or 30 years Time Magazine declared that God is dead in 66 only to see the religious right roar back to life 10 years later large part due to the higher birth rates amongst the more religiously serious with the new atheism literally dead and buried, we see a resurrection, a resurgence, and somewhat unrecognizable evangelism battling a new age for social dominance. <laughs> Some believe young, vital Islam will simply wait for the aging decadent West to collapse, bring Europe under its heels. But I see serious winds of change for the current status quo, especially to Europe, but to the rest of the world as well on that matter. It will not be pretty, and respectable people will be willing to let pre-selective black hats do all the dirty work, I'm sure. And to the engine room of what will, I don't know, lead to massive worldwide change. Let's just say the money you're saving at the gas pumps is not the work of the market forces. Are you ready for 99 cent gasoline? Please join me, everybody, next Wednesday. We'll talk some more. Thank you very much for coming, guys, and uh, have a wonderful week. Hang in there. Don't lose faith. We'll be okay. <laughs>